let's get started. Uh, all right, your uh, next homework assignment is due on Wednesday. And uh, a word about the, the grading of the homework this semester, I don't have a grader for the class. And so what that means is that I wouldn't be able to provide you the same level of detail as I would prefer you get when there's a grader available. Um, so what I'm going to be doing is I'm going to be posting the solutions online so that you can view them on Blackboard and check your homework assignment against the uh, solution that uh, I've prepared. And uh, if you have questions, if you still can't figure out the, the difference between your solution and the one that I've posted, then you know, you're welcome to stop by and ask me about that. Um, today we're going to continue talking about the uh, pipe friction and sizing. You know, last time we went through an iterative process in class where we, we were using a spreadsheet to simultaneously determine the friction factor that applied and the pipe diameter that's required um, for a known flow rate and a certain head loss. So we'll look at an explicit formula that can be used for that same question. And then uh, two other formulas that are used to estimate the effect of um, head loss due to pipe friction. The Hayes and Williams equation and the Manning's equation. So any, oh, I think that probably is wrong, the third. Yeah, it's not the third, right? It would be Wednesday is the 26th. I need to pay better attention to that. Homework two is January 26th. So let me just double check on Blackboard to make sure that matches the schedule that's posted there. Here's our schedule. So homework two, due on the 26th, yeah. All right. Any questions? All right, so last time we went through a spreadsheet and on that spreadsheet we were looking at the um, for a flow rate and a known head loss and a pipe length, um, a pipe material would be defined and that defines like the epsilon or the relative roughness, k sub s. Those were all the given details and the, uh, the problem with that iterative approach was that we were trying to find the diameter of the pipe which depended on the friction factor f and the friction factor f depended on the diameter of the pipe. So it was this interrelated relationship that we solved by guessing an F value, calculating the diameter that would apply if that was the friction factor, then updating the F value and adjusting the diameter in an iterative approach until the solution converged. And what we said convergence was is when the diameter isn't changing anymore from iteration to iteration and when the F value has also stabilized. So it was kind of like a two parameter convergence we were looking for. And that's how we knew we were done and we knew what the diameter that was required. There is an explicit approach and this is the formula that we could use instead of that iterative approach. And it's, as you can see, a pretty complicated empirical equation. It's not as accurate as the other approach. It's, I guess you could say easier as long as you don't make a calculation error. Uh, we won't go through and s solve the same problem, but if we did, I can show you, the, uh, the diameter is pretty close to what we got with that spreadsheet approach. I don't know if you've got your calculations from last time, but with the spreadsheet, we ended up calculating that the required diameter was 0 0.1707 meters. So diameter was 0 0.1707 meters on that example from Wednesday. And if we substituted all of the given data into this formula, then the uh, solution that we get is, let me pull that up, 0 0.175. So it's pretty close. It's within a few percent. But it's easy to uh, get an exponent wrong. There's just so much happening there that um, I don't know. It's good to know about it. So that is, uh, again, solving for the diameter that's needed if you know the flow rate and you know the head loss that's available to drive the flow through the conduit. Now, 
Um, the Darcy Wiesbach equation, which we've been mostly focusing on so far, is the most accurate of the empirical resistance equations. And it's the most flexible, meaning that you can use it for any fluid, over any range of conditions, any pipe diameter. Uh, it's a very robust approach. But the tricky thing about it is determining F. You can use the um, Moody diagram, the Jane equation, the Colbrick equation, but it's non-trivial to calculate F because F is changing depending on the flow conditions. The other two methods that we'll look at today are easier to use, but they're less accurate because the friction factor that's used in those other equations doesn't adjust based on the flow conditions. It's a fixed friction factor. Okay, so the Hazen-Williams equation, you may remember from fluid mechanics when we were um, looking at the pipe rack, you were calculating the Hazen-Williams equation C value. And uh, in doing that, the Hazen-Williams equation really is calibrated towards pipe diameters that are 50 millimeters to 1850 millimeters. That's the range. And uh, all of the pipes that we have in that pipe rack are smaller than 50 millimeters. So that's part of why some of the results were inconsistent when you were uh, comparing your calculated C values to what would be published is we were using the Hazen-Williams equation on a pipe that was really too small for what's intended. The other limitation is that Hazen-Williams equation assumes that the fluid is water and it assumes the fluid is at 16 degrees Celsius. Uh, that's because viscosity, kinematic viscosity, density, all of those fluid properties that F value can take into account like the specifics of it, the C value isn't going to adjust depending on the temperature of the water. It's just the C value is based for water that's 16 degrees Celsius and it's also limited to velocities of three meters per second. Now these are pretty good limitations because in a drinking water distribution network usually the pipes are within this range and water usually is about 16 degrees Celsius and velocities are typically less than three meters per second. So these aren't ridiculous constraints, but they are constraints. It's easier to use because the C value is constant for a pipe material. It doesn't change with the flow conditions. So here's the Hazen-Williams equation for SI units or for traditional units. And it can be expressed in one of two ways. It can be expressed in terms of calculating an unknown velocity when you are given the slope of the energy grade line, S sub F, and S sub F is defined as the head loss due to pipe friction divided by the length of the pipe. So that's one formulation, but if you rearrange this equation to solve for an unknown H sub F, then this is what the Hazen-Williams equation looks like. If you were trying to find out, for example, how much head loss there was for a certain flow velocity through a given pipe diameter and a known pipe length, and then you know what the pipe is made out of, like cast iron, for example. So you'd go to the table, look up the C value for cast iron, and then with all those flow conditions and a knowledge of what the network looks like, you could calculate the head loss due to pipe friction, the H sub F. So we're gonna use uh, both of these formulas in an example today. We'll use one of them to solve for V, the other to solve for H sub F, just so you get some practice. And the reason why practice is important is um, this Darcy Wiesbach equation, because it takes a little bit longer, you're unlikely to see this on the FE exam. It's not a three minute problem. You know, you're more likely to use the Darcy Wiesbach equation in professional practice because it's more accurate. But like if you're just thinking about like an upcoming test you may take someday, the FE exam, the FE exam is, most of the questions are supposed to be in the range of about three to maybe five minutes. And the Hazen-Williams equation is very suitable for those shorter questions. So it's good to have some practice. And also it's good because there are still plenty of firms that use it for design. Okay, so on that note, let's look at this first example. Let's say that water's flowing from a tank and this tank is open to the atmosphere and the water surface is at an elevation of 103.5 meters. So this would be our location one where the water is coming from. 
and the water flows down through this conduit, a pipe that is cast iron. And we go to a table and find the Hayes and Williams coefficient, C sub H, for cast iron is 130. Um, so what we want to know is what is the pressure of the water just before it goes out of this spigot? So the pressure, obviously, once it goes into the atmosphere, once there's a jet of water coming out of this faucet, the pressure is zero. We want to find out what's the pressure of the water before it flows through the valve and exits into the atmosphere. So the pressure right here, just before it exits, where the elevation is known to be 55 meters, and then the water that's going through the pipe is 11 liters per second. I have this note here. You can assume that the velocity head is negligible. What that means is here at location two, we've seen before in previous examples that there's very little energy that's tied up as velocity head. It's a very minor um, contributor to where the energy goes. Like here in the energy equation, the three places the energy is stored is pressure head, elevation head, and velocity head. And of course, between one and two, there's no pump. So the H sub P term is going to cancel out to zero because there's no pump. But there is H sub F. As the water flows through the pipe, we're losing energy due to pipe friction. And so what we're going to use is the Hayes and Williams equation. Instead of Darcy Wiesbach, which we sometimes use, this time we're going to use the Hayes and Williams equation to tell us how much energy loss there is through that pipe. All right, so flow rate 11 liters per second. You're going to use that flow rate Q in order to determine the velocity. So let me just outline on the whiteboard the steps you ought to uh, follow. Of course, it's totally fine and encouraged even for you to be uh, checking your answers and collaborating with your classmates as you work through this. But the, uh, broadly speaking, the steps for this example is first of all to calculate the velocity so step one calculate v and you're going to do that through q divided by area all right then step two is you're going to calculate h sub f using the hayes and williams equation and then the uh, third step is to solve for P2 using the energy equation. So here's the energy equation. And just to review, location one is the tank. Location two is here on the downstream end of the pipe after it's flowed through this entire 760, millimeter, uh, 760 meter length. All right, so let me pause here and give you some time to crunch the numbers. I've got the solution. I can circulate around if you want to check some of your intermediate work. So the pressure here at location two depends on a few different things. There's an elevation difference, of course. And so the elevation difference is going to have an impact on the pressure. And the energy equation takes that into account because it's got Z1 and Z2. Um, the pressure at 2 is also going to be affected by the energy, due to, energy loss due to pipe friction. So I've got up on the screen the calculations we have to do to get the uh, flow velocity. Looks like it's 1.4 meters per second. And then uh, substituting that into the Hayes and Williams equation tells us that the uh, head loss is going to be 17.54 meters. during a flow rate of 11 liters per second. So if the elevation difference isn't at least that, then we couldn't get um, 11 liters per second. You can only get 11 liters per second if 
there's at least enough head loss to overcome that, uh, enough elevation difference to overcome the head loss due to pipe friction. Now, substituting into the energy equation, you'll notice that I've canceled out P1 because what we're talking about is a reservoir that's open to the atmosphere here at location one. And canceling out the velocity head at one because that's a, uh, a tank of water that's stationary. The fluid that's in the tank isn't moving. There's no pump, so that's canceled out. I accidentally crossed out P2, but that's actually what I'm solving for. So I don't cancel out P2. And then um, we are neglecting the velocity head at two. We could include it if we wanted to, but it wouldn't change things much because the velocity is only going 1.4 meters per second. So that if you uh, square that, just to give you an idea, 1.4 squared divided by 2 times 9.81 there's only 0.1 meters of, uh, of head tied up in the velocity head. So um, finding the pressure at two, just rearranging to find uh, what the pressure at two is, it should be about 303 kilopascals. And then once the water goes out of the faucet, it's losing all of that energy. Basically, that's what the spigot is doing to regulate flow. The way this works is, as you twist it, it's uh, moving the, the ball up off of a seal, and it's increasing and decreasing the orifice inside of the valve that the water is able to flow through. So if you only want 11 liters per second, you'd mostly close that, or that valve so that there's just a tiny little orifice, and all of the remaining energy in the pipe is exerted as a local loss as the water flows through at that flow rate. So any questions about these calculations? Hayes and Williams equation problems are great. They're just easy to solve, fun substitutions. But if we solve this same one by um, Darcy Wiesbach, we'd get a slightly different pressure at location two. All right, well, let's look at a uh, similar example, same, same location, but this time, instead of having a fixed flow rate, you know, instead of having this valve control the flow and limit it to 11 liters per second, what we're going to do is we're going to open the valve all the way and see what flow rate can be achieved. So in this example, we have the same origin reservoir with the water surface elevation of 103.5 meters, the same 100 millimeter diameter pipe. So that means that the cross-sectional area is the same. Um, but we want to find out what's the maximum flow rate that can be achieved. So in this next example, we don't follow exactly the same steps, like V is the unknown. And in the previous example, in this one, the first thing we did was calculate V. So uh, in this one, it's not quite the same. Um, what we're going to do is we're going to determine the slope of the energy grade line, S sub F. And what you may remember from the slide earlier today is that S sub F, the slope of the energy grade line, is the head loss due to pipe friction divided by the uh, pipe length. So let me write this on the board so we've got it at the ready you do your calculation. So calculate S sub F, and it is H sub F divided by the pipe length. Now, in this example that we're working, what is the H sub F? If we're going from an open reservoir to an open jet of water that's coming out of that spigot, the H sub F is all of the energy lost between location one and location two. So it's essentially the elevation difference in this example. All of the energy at one minus all of the energy at two is defined as the H sub F. Here in the energy equation, basically if you rearrange the energy equation to solve for H sub F, at location one we've got no pressure 
we've got no velocity, but we have z1. And then here at location 2, we've got no pressure once the jet of the water comes out. You could include the velocity head, but remember it's minor. It's going to be less than a tenth of meter. And so we'll just neglect the V2. And so H sub F is Z1 minus Z2. All right. So let me pause there. Remember what eight R sub H stands for? This is something we covered, I think, maybe last Friday. Hydraulic, hydraulic radius. radius. That's right. And so what is hydraulic radius? Correct. That's right. For a closed circular pipe, diameter divided by four. If it's a non-circular conduit, the more generalized definition for hydraulic radius is the area divided by wetted perimeter. All right. Okay, so let me pause here. Calculate S sub F, then substitute it into... the uh, Hayes and Williams equation. And we get Hayes and Williams equation as velocity. So then you'll have to calculate Q from that. All right. A look at the solution for this one. Um, so we don't know what the flow rate's going to be. It's just the valves all the way open. The only thing providing resistance to flow is the pipe friction. And so this Hayes and Williams equation is going to tell us what would be the flow velocity when we have some pipe friction that is uh, wrapped up in the slope of the energy grade line. The hydraulic radius defines kind of the diameter of the conduit. This is the roughness of the pipe. So first thing we have to do is solve for H sub F because that's what's going to go into the slope of the energy grade line. Okay, so here if you substituted all of the known information into the energy equation, that is the H sub F. So it's just effectively the change in elevation between the two points. So 48.5 meters because we've got 103.5 here at the tank and 55 meters at the spigot. So in the energy equation, P1 is 0, V1 is 0, P2 is 0. There's no pump, so that's 0. V2, it's not 0, but we're neglecting it. So basically, H sub F is just Z1 minus Z2. And that's what we've got here as 48.5 meters. So if there's 48.5 meters of energy loss and the pipe length is 760 meters, then the slope of the energy grade line is 0 0.06381. A hydraulic radius for a circular pipe where the water is flowing full it's just the diameter divided by 4, so we've got that. And then substituting it into the uh, Hayes and Williams equation gives us that the flow velocity is going to be 2.444 meters per second. And then if we multiply that by the area, that's how we can get that the flow rate is 0 0.0192 cubic meters per second. Divide that, or multiply it by 1,000 just to get maybe a, a more easily to understand and conceive of the flow rate in liters per second, 19.2 liters per second. So you know like what a two liter of soda is like. So this is saying that if you had a big tank full of soda, I don't know, it, soda is pretty much water with sugar mixed in, but to give you an idea of what that elevation difference and that pipe diameter and the pipe length, how much flow could be achieved if it's just gravity that's pushing it. Now, we could solve the same thing if there was a pump. Like if there was a pump in between the reservoir and the spigot, then it would be providing additional energy and the flow rate would be even higher because now the driving force would include both 
the Z1, but also some amount of head that's attributed to the pump. So it really wouldn't have made the uh, problem too much more tricky if we had some details about how much head the pump was adding. It would just, in the end, increase the flow rate through that pipe. Any questions on uh, this example? Okay, Manning's equation, just like Hayes and Williams, is easy to calculate because the friction factor doesn't change based on flow conditions. You determine the friction factor just by looking it up out of a table based on what the material is. So C values are in the range of about 100. N values are in the range of about 0 0.0. One five, like just to give you a ballpark of maybe a middle range end value. Manning's equation can be used in pipe flow, but um, it's more commonly used in open channel flow calculations because it's more accurate for open channel flow. Uh, we have better techniques for closed pipe flow, so Manning's equation isn't often used for pipes that are flowing full. It is used. For sewer pipes though. So if it's a pipe that's flowing by gravity, meaning that it's not under pressure, then Manning's equation is the technique that's used to predict the capacity of flow through like a sanitary sewer pipe or a storm sewer pipe. Um, there is a units correction factor for traditional units of 1.485. And here, Manning's equation is written in terms of velocity. So if you wanted to determine the flow rate, obviously you just multiply that by the area. Well, let me write something on the board here. OK, so if we're starting out with velocity is 1 over n times the right radius hydraulic to the 2 thirds and slope to the one half. If we want Q, so Q would be area divided by N times the hydraulic radius to the two thirds and slope to the one half. Everybody's with me so far. Remember that hydraulic radius, the definition of hydraulic radius is area divided by the wetted perimeter. Okay, so another way we could write this is area divided by N, area divided by P to the two-thirds, and slope to the one-half. So now what I could do is I could combine these two area terms together. And so Manning's equation, for a lot of the uh, spreadsheets that we set up, the way that we'll put Manning's equation into the spreadsheet is like this. Area to the 5 thirds, slope to the 1 half, divided by n times p to the 2 thirds power. So this is kind of the version of Manning's equation that I use most often. But it's essentially the same thing. You're using an n value. Oh, yeah. You're using an n value to uh, predict the capacity for a certain channel geometry and a certain slope. So what's driving the flow is the slope. What's resisting the flow is the friction of the conduit. And then how big the area is is also a factor. So we'll use Manning's equation a lot for these open channel calculations, and here is a trapezoidal channel. We looked at trapezoidal channel geometry in an earlier class, like how to calculate the area as a function of y, the wetted perimeter as a function of y, the flow depth. But it's also used for, this is a circular pipe that's not flowing full. So these are actually really challenging um, calculations, the geometry of a circular pipe that's not flowing full. I mean, it's not like really challenging. We don't need a NASA supercomputer, but um, I mean, it's, it's trickier than you might otherwise expect uh, when you've got a circular pipe, but there's just a non-full depth that's flowing th through it. 
So when we use Manning's equation for this kind of calculation, there's a, a variety of different adjustments we have to make, like the n value that would go into Manning's equation varies as a function of how full the pipe is. Because if you have really shallow flow, like if the water depth is really shallow, then more of the water is in close contact with the concrete than if it's relatively full. So we'll look at, at towards the end of the semester, these nomographs that uh, make adjustments for the end value, the cross-sectional area, the flow depth, and so on for a partly full pipe. Um, here's a table of typical roughness coefficients for both Hayes and Williams equation and Manning's equation. So you'll notice that um, newer pipes will have different friction factors than old pipes. And the reason for that is in the case of Hayes and Williams equation, a high C value is a smooth pipe and a low C value is more rough. So what this is saying is in the case of ductile or cast iron, if it's old and an unlined pipe, that the corrosion that can occur in an old pipe provides more resistance than a new pipe that's a little bit more smooth. So they give you a range of C values and maybe a typical midpoint that would be used if you don't have any other information, maybe just pick something in the middle of the range. But if you've got a pipe that's 20 or 30 years old, it may not be behaving the same as a new pipe, both because there could be corrosion or the flip side of that is that there could be deposition in the pipe. Let me see if I can find an image of that because it's worth taking a look at. have to search for a good uh, a good image but let me just sketch it on the board basically what happens is you know pipes have minerals in it like calcium carbonate is one that is uh, pretty important it's dissolved from limestone into the water and it um, precipitates from the water onto pipes and it really precipitates a lot onto like hot water heaters um, I keep my house warm with a a wood burning stove and it gets really dry you know during the winter time it dries out all the humidity so I put a, a pan of water on top of the wood burning stove just to evaporate some water and get some moisture into the air and when I do that the water boils all night long and if I let it run dry then there's like a white residue at the bottom of the pan have you ever seen that before that's calcium carbonate so there's all these dissolved minerals in water and um, it's pretty complicated to predict which of them may precipitate. It depends on the pH, um, the pipe material itself, some of the uh, temperature has an effect, like calcium carbonate, its solubility decreases with heat. Most other things, the solubility increases with heat, like salt, for example. You can get more water to dissolve, uh, more salt to dissolve in warm water than you can in cold water. So most minerals are that way, where you can dissolve more of it in hot water, but calcium carbonate, as it turns out, the solubility is reversed. So warm water, it begins to precipitate. So long story short is what can happen is that you may have a pipe when it's new is, let's say, 100 millimeters when it's new. But then you have water flowing through that pipe for years and years and years. And you can have calcium begin to accumulate on the inside of the pipe, and it can reduce the effective flow diameter of that pipe quite a lot. So you could lose 30, 40, 50 percent of your flow capacity, both because the area is smaller, but also it may be more rough than the original surface was. If it was a plastic pipe that was relatively smooth, then you would have had less resistance because of a higher C value. But then when you have some calcium carbonate or other minerals that begin to adhere to the outside edge of the pipe and, um, and are in contact with the water, then the roughness would be different than what the pipe itself is made out of. So it may be closer to like a concrete pipe if you have a lot of mineralization. So uh, that is it for today. Remember that what you are working on is uh, homework two that's due on Wednesday next week. 
So I will see you on Monday.